Welcome to We're Not Wizards. We are the best, but not wizards. Enjoy the show! of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for, we're going to say March, April. It's kind of like, okay, look, it's the 29th of March, okay? And the person I'm speaking to, um, you could call them a repeat offender, because not because they're <laughs> offensive, but because they're back on again. And we just, I just realised that the last time I spoke to this person was, way, as we said, was back in 2019, January 2019. So it was before everything kind of got kind of interesting and different um <laughs> you can say since then we had it we had there was a lot of things brewing at the time in the background that uh that this person can talk about and since then they have gone on to form their own company they have successfully brought um a game to kickstarter you could say it was part of it was maybe a bit of a key keystone to their success, um, <laughs> and now now that they've done that, and they've seen what the wildlife's out out there and like, they're going to take their trip out their back door into their wild gardens. So joining me <laughs> <laughs> with his with his flowery gloves, and, or his or their rose or their rose gauntlet, as you would say. <laughs> I've got, I've got the wonderful Isaac Vega. Hello. Oh, well, th- thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> I just been, I've been pacing up and down in front of, uh, of when I was out with the dog, saying, "How can I? How can I intro? Where would you start? <laughs> how do you start an intro like? How do you start an intro like this?" And I've already kind of proffered Isaac with embarrassment by kind of like going, oh, look, I've got, I've got ashes. And it's not just ashes, it's ashes reborn. It's the whole thing inside that box. And also got a, uh, and City of Remnants, which is obviously a blast from the past. So those, those, that's what I was doing first of all. But secondly, what an amazing couple of years you had. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, oh, yeah. I mean, let's let, as we say in these things, what we do is we like to have a little kind of look back I guess at the kind of the plaid hat of the past, <laughs> before mm-hmm. we step into the rose gauntlet of the present and potentially the the wild gardens of the future. Um, first of all, what what made you decide to jump ahead and go and form Rose Gauntlet? Because I know I think yeah. I think I remember at the time there was a situation where plaid hat got bought out. And then the company got gutted a bit and there was people that kind of left and stayed and didn't go. And it, was that the kind of the catalyst that kind of spurred you on to say, right, I got it. I'm going to do my own thing now. This is going to happen. Yeah. So um, I had been working with uh, uh, Plaid Hat for almost 10 years of my life. Mm. And by that point, um, loved the team, loved, uh, loved working with them, but I had kind of gotten a little weary of like the entire corporatization because we had gotten bought Mm. multiple times of everything. And I just wanted to kind of have a little bit more freedom. And when Colby came to me and let me know that like uh, uh, he had the opportunity to buy back Plaid Hat Games from Asmodee and become independent again, I thought it was a good opportunity to go ahead and step away and step in my own direction and see if there was a different path for me to start growing through. I really loved the team at Plaid Hat, but I wanted to experiment with something new, wanted to try something fresh, and I thought it was a good time to go ahead and go in my own direction. So uh, I didn't know exactly what that was going to look like (laughs) um, uh, when I started. Uh, Luckily, 2020 started off the year (laughs) year with a lot of extra (laughs) time for everybody to think. Um, And uh, by uh, mid-summer of 2020, I called up my good friend Lindsay, who I'd been wor- wanting to work with for a very long time. Yeah, and we discussed uh, the foundation of what would be eventually become Rose Gauntlet, and uh, we formed the company in September and announced in early 2021. 
was it was there a bit of kind of intrep in a bit of trepidation about kind of starting off? I mean, even though you're successful, there must be a little bit of you oh, kind yeah. of like because uh, I know there's this kind of like imposter syndrome. It's like I know I'm good. I've designed all these games. People say they love my games. People say my games are brilliant. I'm gonna go by myself. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm sure uh, everybody can agree that anybody thinking that the perfect time to start a company is in the year 2020 <laughs> in our universe is probably not going to think <laughs> that was such a great idea. Um, so there was, there was a lot of concerns about that. Like mm. we didn't have no idea what the state of the industry would look like yeah. uh, through the course of handling the ups and downs of the pandemic. Um, there are so many things that we're still dealing with the wake of that. Mm -hmm. Um uh, so that was a huge concern. Number one, number two was, you know, uh, I came, I was at Plat Hat, um, and with Asma Day and things with a huge system in place. Right. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to be a designer, um, have an entire art team mm. at my call, have graphic designers at my call, um, have, have people around me to test and play and, uh, give me feedback as much as possible. And with Lindsay and I transitioning over to Rose Call, it was just me and her to start off with. Yeah. Right. Uh, of course, we've developed our team since then, and we've brought on contractors and different people that have definitely cheerleaded us along the way. Yeah, but it's it's definitely a different uh, system that you're stepping out of, and then stepping into a, you know completely creating everything from scratch. And then there's the entire aspect of like now you're not just a designer, you're not just a, a VP, um, you're you're the head of the company. You're trying to figure out how everything is going to move forward. Yeah, you're trying to figure out how all the entire side of the business world works and figuring out all the different ins and outs of running a business, which is you know scary but also like very exciting to me because like that was part of the reason that I left is that I wanted a new challenge. I wanted a, another stepping stone to kind of just like improve myself in my career. Um, so I, I was like both scared, but both very excited. And I had done a lot of preparing uh, to get to this point and I had saved up and I had known more or less what cost and what investment would be making into the company. So we were definitely a, a lot more prepared than most, but because it was such a scary time um, and so many things were changing, it was of course very nerve wracking as well. And me and Lindsay are still, we still both work in two different states in the United States. She's in Michigan. I'm in Texas. So we're both working remotely. We had an entire year. We didn't even see each other uh, <laughs> since we formed the company. So uh, there was that too, where it's just like, uh, we're like, we don't have the opportunity to even see each other um, or hang out or be able to kind of uh, do those things. We had did everything remotely and online. Which has been great. It's been a great learning process, but it's never been the way that I'd worked before either. Yeah. Um, so that was interesting transition too. It must be different to be involved in a company where you've actually got the face to face element, especially in a creative right. thing. And I know, I know that people say that. And I, I, I work kind of online for my job. I, I've, I've never gone back to the office since. We've never gone back to the office since like March twenty twenty. I, I kind of basically and. You know, my my lovely boss can turn around and says, we kind of don't need to, but there's there's still no clients kind of sneaking in that are going kind of wouldn't mind a kind of a face to face meeting. And there's part of me that's like, oh, I don't want to be near you. And then there's, <laughs> and there's part of me that goes, well, actually, sometimes in a creative aspect, I can imagine you sitting down with like, especially in a in a board game design environment where it's tactile and you've kind of got marker and placement cards and you've got meeples here, there and everywhere that sometimes you just need, so you want somebody, you want to be able to reach across the table and just say, well, how about we do three cards instead of four and just let right. see what that kind of looks like. And I know you can kind of simulate it and kind of like all these simulation tabletopia, tabletop, whatever kind of programs, but I can imagine actually there's something quite lovely about physically seeing a board game that you're designing or co-designing kind of kind of coming together yeah yeah i had never uh utilized any of the uh digital platforms for testing prior to this uh, prior to starting rose gauntlet um so we transit we started off with tabletop simulator transitioned over to tabletopia mm. and that's also like hey we're presenting our game in a in a format that it, we don't ever intend to release it yeah. <laughs> so 
So uh, that also creates its own issues and um, like trying to make sure that like people understand the program and how to use it yeah. and all that kind of things. So like being, I still uh, prefer uh, physical playtesting <laughs> more than anything else. And that was definitely something that I, I really missed uh, during that time period. We, we still offer physical prototyping uh, for mm. our playtesters. <clears throat> Um, but it's just, it's most of them take advantage of the digital format, especially with our games that have a lot of cards and different moving parts. Um, so it's, it's useful in some ways and, uh, saves people time in some ways, but in other ways, it's a entire other process that I, again, wasn't used to. And it was so much easier to be able to go right next door to the office and yeah. like, be able to say, Hey, all right, I'm going to change these cards. Or I'm going to write this in there on the fly instead of now yeah. the process is, okay, I made the changes. Let me submit it to the person that's going to upload it into the digital format and then wait a week. To make all <laughs> that work exactly. And exactly. And I have kind of done <clears throat> preview pieces for, I've mm. played, I've played kind of versions of games on, um, on, I think it was maybe tabletop simulator. And everything kind of looks polished and everything like that, but there is, I mean, you can't say, well, this is how the game's kind of going to play. There's something, I think it's different if, I think it's different if, like, say I've played, like, say, online, I've been on BGA, and a lot of people have been on BGA and played a lot of games on BGA, and there's also the apps, I mean, if you play any, like, Root and stuff like that. But I think the difference with playing something like Root is, it's more of a like it's a gamified event as opposed to like a simulation and so and i've see it, i see it more and more in kind of like reviewers groups on facebook where somebody says oh um we're looking for people to kind of write previews or preview our game for kickstarter and we're going to be running table you know tts sessions or tabletopia sessions and people kind of aren't in that interested in it and I think it was because and there was part of me that's thinking oh that's because people kind of like would prefer to have physical copies so they can have a physical copy right but it is also so people can kind of have a physical copy because there's some games like um and I'll get I mean an example you know your your own game Keystone I mean, when you when you get that when that was sitting in front of me and there was like the the mat and there was all the cards and you know uh, you do you you kind of get to really you can't really get close up and appreciate the kind of the art and the work that's gone into the different components. I think in an electric version, in an electric right. an electric version. Here I am, Scottish, surrounded by candles. Um, <laughs> there's the moon. Um, but you know what I mean. There's, I think that I think I I associate. I'm such a lad. I, I guess I still I still associate board games very much with a kind of a tactile situation where I've got my hands on some kind of components, which I. Which you know, it's just I guess that's just my just myself. Um Well, I think that's why board games still have their place in the market yeah. in this world where, you know, there are amazing, amazing digital games. Like there there are plenty of different avenues to take there, but you know, the tactile um uh beauty of being able to play these games at your table, being able to sit across other people and enjoy it with them, like you you're we're not take it like nothing in the digital realm can take that away from us mm -hmm. right um and that's why i think board games are so special because they exist in the physical space and they in there are these things that you can play and touch and look at and yeah. enjoy and so, so like it's part of the entire process so that's why testing physically is so nice um and uh, sought after and be being able as a designer to just like get stuff to the to the page and get stuff to the table and see people's reactions right there in real life is fantastic and it's really helps uh being able to improve upon the game as well i have a question in relation to rose gauntlet itself which is how many names did you go through before it you know you decided on that Oh um, my gosh! It feels like it feels like at least a hundred. <laughs> See, I, we I was wanting to say something like, so you know, I just went much. outside and I was in my, I was like in my friend's garden, and you know, and a rose fell down and it landed, and I picked it up and I had gloves on, and I just went, well, here we go. 
but <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Like we had, we had so much, we had so many different ideas mm. uh, for the name, but we always knew that we wanted to invoke something that had a sense of magic to it, a sense of fantasy, but also had a sense of inviting people in, uh, had a sense of like softness and, and warmth yeah. um, as well. And we kind of, and that's why we landed on Rose Gauntlet. We felt like the Rose aspect was, you know, growth, growing, um, but inviting and kinds, but the gauntlet was still magical and fantastical, but also uh, defensive and outspoken in the industry. You know what I mean? So like we kind of brought those two aspects together and really felt that it represented who we wanted to be as a company. No, no, absolutely. I mean, you've always, you've always come across as a kind of a, I'd say a very kind of strong minded soul, but also every interaction I've had with you, I've always walked away going, such a nice, decent man. <laughs> <It's Aww. lovely. laughs> you know what I mean? So when I see that, I say like, okay, you've got the strength of the gauntlet, but you've also got the kind of the rose. So it's like associates a kind of like a, almost like a delicacy or a softness, mm. the ro- you know, the, the actual petals of the rose itself, you know, people, you know, spread rose petals about when they're what, you know, when they're kind of, uh, they're wanting to show an appreciation as well. What about the color scheme? Because that, because when I saw that, I went, I love it. You know, the, the kind of the, the kind of yeah, the light, kind of turquoise, blue, blue. Did you, did you go through that again? Was that another kind yeah, of? Yeah, we, ha- we had our graphic designer at the time present us, I th- believe, with, um, I think they presented us with 25 different color concepts. Wow. And we actually didn't like most of them. And then it had them combined two that we thought were really good. And that's how it came all together. Mm-hmm. Um, so we really loved that. It just was a striking pose. Again, it, it uh, our, our striking color scheme. Um, and it really, it really kind of, again, evoked the same kind of feelings, but also yeah. uh, gave it some sort of separation from all the different logos that exist in the industry. <laughs> um, there's so many, there's so many reds and greens that are in tabletop as far as when it comes to logos or just straight up black. Uh, so we wanted to also have something that stood out a little bit too. Yeah. No, it just pops and you immediately, it just, you know, I could recognize it. And you're right. It's like the mixture of the, 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 the two mixtures of the color, you don't, it's not something that I've seen in a comp, you know, a combination kind of before. Um, in terms of then, so you then, you then went and, you, you kind of design kicks, you design Keystone. Now, in terms of the chronology of the design, was was Keystone always there? Was it the first one that you made? Or was it a case that you had kind of Wild Garden sitting there, you had kind of um, Keystone there, and, and, and Keystone was just the one that was kind of like the most ready to kind of take to, to kind of Kickstarter at the time? So actually, we didn't start the company with the intention of releasing Keystone first. Keystone was a project that was brought to us by Jeff Joyce, um, the co-designer on the game. Hmm. Um, and he he had been working on it throughout, I, I believe, for about a year prior. And um, I had been giving him some consultation during the summer before we even started the company and hmm. just helping out a friend and things like that. And then the more and more um, that I played it, the more I thought it could be a good fit. For what we wanted to accomplish with the games that we were releasing through our company i presented the game over to lindsay we discussed in ways on how to improve it yeah. uh, how to change it and uh, uh that's when i came on as a co-designer in order to help make some uh, changes faster and it just got to a place where we were all really happy with it yeah. and then decided that it should be the first launch of our uh, company and and when you went and announced you know the game and you announced kind of rose gauntlet were you um were you expecting the kind of level of support and kind of positivity well, that surrounded it. I remember you guys, you guys announcing it. <laughs> I remember yeah, you and Lindsay yeah, announcing yeah. the company and I just remember kind of going, okay, okay. Do, 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 do. Everybody's talking about <laughs> this. It's going to be, was it nice to kind of go, oh, actually this is, you know, it was a bit overwhelming to kind of, yeah, we we announced it mm. in um we announced it in January of 2021 yeah. and we expected to you know we we we've been working in the industry for a little while so we mm. of course we expected some of our friends to be on the bandwagon and to be supporting us mm. um but we did not expect the level of 
intense fervor for our company the amount of people that we got signing up for our social media things yeah um and people just super excited about seeing us both working together yeah. and both working on something new um i think we were also very strategic with our launch letting yeah. people know that like hey um we're not just another game company we're coming in here as uh we call it rose gauntlet entertainment for a reason yeah we have other things in mind uh for the future like we're we we announced uh originally three games we announced keystone we announced life after dungeon which is sitting more in the rpg hmm. uh, side of the industry and we uh, announced um gone to gaia which is a video game um that we're hoping to release as well um so these are all things that we you know dream to put together they're all things that are still taking place and worked on in the background yeah you, you just um, allow for a different level of time yes. <laughs> um, and development and since we are a two-person team there is quite a, a quite a, a, a small amount of time that we can you know devote to every single one of those projects but they're all moving forward and we're all really excited to get them out there as quickly as we can. Hmm. Uh, Keystone obviously was the most ready, was the first one, and that was within the medium that we're the most experienced within. Yes. Uh, board games. But our next project after Wild Gardens is Full Force uh, Life After Dungeon, which we have so many things already moving forward on and we're so excited about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're hopefully announcing that one either later this year um, with some more information later this year or early next year. Um, and with Gone to Gaia, there, that's still development in the background, but mm. it's also us learning a whole bunch of stuff about the video game industry and learning all the different things that we have to do there. But the reason that we called it Rose Gone Entertainment is because we wanted the company to grow with us and we wanted it to be able to uh, sit within the uh, areas of uh, entertainment that we're excited to pursue yeah. and excited to be as a company. And we don't just want to grow in the direction of just tabletop games what we want to do is be able to show that tabletop games are avenues to all these different ways of enjoying um uh different ways to spend time with people and mm. our big thing is about how can we develop community how can we uh engage with our community and how can our community enjoy all these different ways to connect with other human beings has running the company has that taken away your time from not only just designing but actually more like the playing are you are you still making sure that you're kind of taking time out to go ahead and spend a couple of hours just enjoying a board game without having to think about the design aspect or the money side of things think, and promoting side i think the pandemic took that away from me more than anything <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Early on, it's definitely been like I've been rebuilding that at home yeah. as much as possible um, to play more games. Um, so uh, I, I can't really say I've I've like had more or less of a normal cadence because I've worked in games so long. Yeah, like there there are times of of working at a games company where I don't want to look at a board game when I'm done with work. <laughs> It's done <laughs> and there are times when um i just want to play everything because i'm trying to solve something yeah. or i'm just inspired by how many amazing things that are coming out in the industry so there's there's times where i play a ton and times when i play a lot right now i haven't played too much because like i'm finishing up wild gardens which is always the hardest part of a project for me because i see the finish line but then yeah. there's all these little things to check off um so that that like makes me hyper focused on like the work side of things um but then as far as like like the business side of things honestly that's there's been so many cool things that we've learned so many interesting decisions that we're making that it yeah. kind of feels like a game within itself <laughs> <laughs> um but uh you know and it's just like playing around with that and trying to figure different things out in different ways to make the company work and the fact that I have Lindsay, um, and it's not just like me, it's we're co-owners, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, really, it really gives us an opportunity to kind of just bounce off each other. And then there's other new opportunities. Like I said, we're exploring new things. So we've been playing a lot of new RPGs as of late, just to kind of get in the mode of being able to have a really clear understanding of the different directions we want to take Life After Dungeon in. Yeah. And that hasn't necessarily been the case in my past. Like I, I dabbled a little bit in RPGs here and there, but I hadn't been like fully immersed like in playing a whole bunch of stuff or being part of an active regular group. And that's something that I'm really excited that we've been doing as of late. Um, 
So I feel like my gaming, if anything, has stayed pretty consistent yeah, or yeah. increased at certain points, um, especially because I can completely control my own time now yeah exactly. <laughs> as an owner right i'm not necessarily expected to clock in yeah at a specific time and clock out a specific time yeah. so i have more opportunities to kind of say you know what today i'm going to be exploring and researching a whole bunch of new stuff mm. or i'm going to go meet with a friend and be able to do uh some gaming with them uh because they're available right now and yeah. sometimes i didn't really have that freedom yeah beforehand i i worked i worked with plaid hat and i worked Asmodee, which are amazing companies to work with yes. and like very, very flexible, but they still have a certain level of expectation yes. of being there and clocking in and clocking out at a certain time. Uh, so I was definitely had more flexibility than most people, but mm. sometimes with just the way that my brain works um, and how I function, I think it's better for me to have a more freeform schedule that I can go ahead and control and manipulate as I see fit. Has, has there been a change in the dynamic of the friendship? Have have you had to learn when you're kind of when you're making dis- businesses decisions to kind of kind of be more stricter with each other in terms of saying right we need to we need to do this and get it done because I I I know that the the big the big thing about friends working together is that it can end up becoming the biggest laugh right up until somebody forgets we've got a pile of bills we should have pressed a right. button and paid so has right. has have you kind of said right have you kind of went right we're going to kind of almost like ring fence where the friendship is so that we can still concentrate on the business enough so it doesn't affect either kind of side of it so luckily Lindsay and i have both worked in situations where we worked with friends before Mm. um obviously we were i was really friendly with a lot of people at plat hack games and really enjoyed working there and you know got really close to many of them um uh, but like having known that and having experienced that, we pretty much laid down some pretty good ground rules at the beginning of the company mm-hmm. and really understood that like, hey, our friendship is first. Number one, we don't want to we don't want to have this damage our friendship in any way. Yeah. If anything, we want it to increase our friendship and increase our closeness. And in all in all aspects, to be completely honest, it has. We communicate better than we ever have before. Mm-hmm. We're spending more time with each other than we ever have before. <laughs> We've grown to love each other and uh, respect each other and see each other grow than we ever had before. Yeah. Um, so in all of those things, it is fantastic. Whenever we have an issue or anything, what's lucky with us is that we have a very strict um, schedule of meeting up once a week and discussing any issues that came up during the week previously. Yeah. Um, so we're able to kind of go through all those things like, oh, we're behind on this. We're able to uh, do this. OK, here's your assignment. Here's my assignment. Here's somebody else's assignment. Um, and here are the things that we need to get done and prioritize. And then we also meet once a quarter to also discuss everything we want to accomplish during that quarter. Um, so every week kind of keeps us in line to making sure that we're having those goals of the quarter being accomplished. Yeah. Um, and that really helps alleviate all tensions. And if there's ever things that aren't uh, completed and uh, not not gotten to, we have a really clear understanding as to why that happens or what reasons or things came up on the way because we're so good at communicating on a consistent basis. Um, I think what develops a lot of problems sometimes when you really don't have a clear understanding of what the other person is doing or what's going on and why certain things aren't being accomplished and when you don't have a clear understanding of what needs to be accomplished. Um, And when those things kind of fall apart, that's when you have tension. But luckily we've done a very good job of avoiding that. Mm -hmm. Um, And whenever there are things that come up in the business or they're at a level of frustration, I'm just like, take a break you need a break. Yeah. Everybody needs a break. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, part of the reason that we wanted to do this company as well is because we wanted to live, uh, a, lives that ha- we had more control over. Um, so being able to take time away from the work or being able to take away time from the business in order to work on our mental health or our health or other family things that come up, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. just all these other things that kind of take place. You know, if we're not making space for that, if our business isn't making space for that, then we have a problem with the structure of a business. So that's what we've always tried to keep in mind first Mm -hmm. is to make sure that we we start. The reason that we started this business is because we didn't want to get in the same 
have the same issues that we had previously. We wanted to be able to have more of a sense of freedom and more of an ability to be able to grow with each other and grow our friendship uh, uh, better as well. So uh, we've we've done a really good job of that so far. Hopefully that stays that way and <laughs> continues getting better and better through time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're bringing kind of whale, whale gardens and we will, I promise you... <laughs> We will talk about well, but I mean, as I say, I could talk to you probably for the next three hours and still not run out of things to say. Um, what made you, what made you decide to switch over to backer kit for the campaign for Wild Guard? I know there's obvious ones like Kickstarter, of just <laughs> continually pooing the bed at the moment. <laughs> you know? it's like, well, yeah, uh, a lot of those things are already self-evident online, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for us is that we took some time at the most recent Gen Con that we were attending to meet with all of the different um, crowdfunding platforms. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to have a clear understanding of like, what are some of the pros and cons of working with you? Mm. Why would we choose one over the other? Because like everything was kind of disrupted when backer kit first announced uh, this past summer or like, uh, so it wasn't even that long ago uh, when they announced and so many people were so many people that we respected in the industry were also jumping over to backer kit. Yeah. So we wanted to number one, find out the reason why we number two wanted to see what the team was like and understand them a little bit better. But it was really just having an understanding of like they are going to do a they are going to do an excellent job of being our cheerleaders along the way. Yeah. They have they have done that. They have been continuously updating us. They have reserved resources for us, um, and that's just a completely different experience than we had with Kickstarter. Right? It's not like their team was particularly problematic. It's just that their team is really stretched out, <laughs> and they have. They have a lot of, you know, they have a lot of different clients and they just don't have the hand holding or um, ability to kind of give us uh, the information that we're looking for on a consistent basis like Backer Kit was. I, I think they come, uh, I think they come from the kind of the same kind of wheelhouse as like, say your, your Patreon and your Twitch of this world, which mm. is Kickstarter has always been quite happy to kind of be in hands off and take the money. Um, mm -hmm. but never seem to be kind of only really introducing kind of additional infrastructure when other people are kind of introducing the infrastructure. Yeah. And there seems to be a collection. It's like the same with like, say, Twitch, that again, quite happy to take the money, not that great in kind of supporting the people that use it. And also, I mean, the big one is obviously Patreon, which is <laughs> happy to take people's <laughs> money as well who are trying to drum up money to live on. But again, it's kind of like the, the, it only seems when it's a last desperate kind of point where they'll kind of change the, the infrastructure. And I continue to right. see people saying that they have, there's still the ongoing issues with kind of Kickstarter in my mind with regards to kind of like it's whole still blockchain technology and stuff like that. And, 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 and yeah. but I, th I think it's like one of these things that's like, um, it's so it's so big and just kind of so well established. Um, it kind of it's almost like the the whole Twitter Mastodon kind of situation, where right, right. you know it, where it, people uh, are kind of like I'm going to jump onto Mastodon and they get there and they're kind of like <laughs> I'm not sure how to get the best out of this platform. And also, there's still quite a few people that I know that are still using this other service. So I've seen, you know, and I, I and but I think in the terms of crowdfunding. I think we do need somebody different. We do need somebody when, especially when things kind of potentially go wrong, that there's a support structure there that, you know, the companies like GameFound and BackerKit and the others will reach out to the the companies that are using their platform and say, well, you know, what's what's going to go on here? How can we help kind of thing as opposed to Kickstarter, which right. is like, well, you ticked a box to say that, you know, you agree that it's just, you, know, you might lose your money kind of thing, which I think is a bit kind of, it's very capitalist, Isaac. <laughs> it's very, it's very well, capitalism. capitalism aside, we yeah, shall exactly. do, its, do its thing no matter what platform we use. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah backer kit just overall. Yeah. The biggest thing for us is that BackerKit was doing a lot of things right. Yeah. We heard a lot of great things about working with BackerKit. Yeah. Uh, we now having experienced and launched a thing on BackerKit, we still are having a great experience. Yeah. Um, and luckily, a lot of our friends in the industry uh, suggested them highly. And because 
they're jumping on doing something new and we're you know ju- we're still so- is somewhat new um yeah. it was a perfect opportunity to take a chance yeah. right uh and it hopefully we will both grow alongside each other and make each other better along the way and we just didn't have that opportunity with kickstarter um so it's a perfect time to make a change uh yeah. it's completely possible that our projects would do just as well uh, or better on a different platform but right now we're really happy yeah. with uh utilizing backer kit and unless we have a reason to change that up or change again i think we'll stick with them for quite some time yeah yeah i mean this whole talk about money and stuff's getting a bit stuffy in here so let's take a walk outside into the wild gardens <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Segways. <laughs> the segue of life um <laughs> so, <laughs> i don't know where i'm going with this i'm reaching out in the dark <laughs> It's getting, you can see, it's like, as we've been talking, um, Isaac's not got his camera on. I have got my camera on. And when I started, it was like, it was still, we're, we've kind of, our clocks have changed recently. So it's been lighter outside, but now it's like, I'm slowly kind of sinking wow. into the into the inky black darkness of Scottish night type. <laughs> um, tell, talk to me about Wild Gardens. Tell me, tell me what yeah, it so, is. Everything I want to know it all. So, Wild Gardens is our latest game that we just launched a backer kit um, as of March 29th. Uh, it's been out for almost a week. It'll be up until April hmm. um, 19th, uh, I believe is the date, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, it is a game for one to four players. Uh, it's a strategic game in which you're trying to collect the most victory points in order to win. You are taking on the role of a forager and you're foraging different ingredients along the path in order to create these wonderful recipes. And then you're utilizing those recipes to then serve to interesting guests that you meet along the way. You're going to be able to score victory points uh, in the traditional way where you get victory points from your recipes, you get victory points from your guests, but guests can also have ways of getting you victory points at the end of the game. There's also an interesting jar mechanic, another way to score victory points on the victory point. Uh, point track um as well that you can go ahead and utilize um and then all of the different uh, guests have unique abilities when you bring them into play that can work into your strategy in cool ways um there is a solo mode as well in the game that will take you through different stories of the guest all of the different guests in the game have little speech bubbles that you can read in story mode uh, or in solo mode <laughs> um and they will give you uh little glimpses into who they are as people they're going to help you on the way or hinder you mm-hmm. <laughs> on the way um and it's all to kind of build the world of wild gardens and understand a little bit more about the wonders of foraging and why it can be such a unifying and um interesting hobby uh just like how the tabletop industry is um wild gardens was really inspired from my time of isolation uh during covid um i ended up watching a lot of different um creators who were foraging who were uh uh, you know taking care of plants who were cooking uh on tiktok and different social media platforms and they just gave me so much um a hope and kindness and joy during that t- period of time that I wanted to create a game that really reflected that and shared um, more about the world of foraging and the world of cooking and how that can be unifying for people. Um, so that's where Wild Gardens is born. And uh, if people are interested, it's now on Backer Kit. I, I, ha- I have a second screen. Because you're like going, <laughs> why is he looking over there? Because I have a second screen and I'm scrolling through the kind of the pictures. <laughs> And it's like, it's almost like the artwork's just like, could we have more colors? Well, we could. <laughs> can, we have even, can we have even more colors? There's kind of colors here that I didn't know it, it kind of existed. See, that was the thing, yes, we, that was the thing with color. Keystone. Keystone was kind of like, you know, and I think I maybe said this on the review that I originally said, was it, it was literally like somebody had like, somebody who'd worked at the Skittles company just walked in and went, taste this rainbow and just went, and, <laughs> and it's the same on this, except I'm actually looking at the kind of the black walnut pie, the sea moss smoothie. And you know, there's, there's, I'm so sal- there's going to be saliva. It's not going to be a good yeah. look. It's not going to be a good look. We were look. very inspired by uh, Studio Ghibli and anime yeah. food. Uh, they do an amazing job of like just making, uh meals look incredibly appetizing and we wanted to make sure that was the case 
in our game as well. So uh, our artist, uh, Liz Minold, did a fantastic job bringing that to life. Absolutely. And we are so, so happy with those pieces. What I found with what I found with Keystone was that um, while it was like presented absolutely beautifully, there was a lot of there was still a lot of what I call thinkage, which is a word I've invented. But <laughs> there was a lot of th- there was a lot of thinkage going on, as in you still had to be planning your moves. You still had to be, you know, because things kind of cascaded when it got to kind of like different environments and 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 the animals and the habitats and obviously the keystone creatures themselves. With and and with the kind of the designs that you've had in the past, I wouldn't necessarily say that you're kind of like you're not like an entry level kind of casual game person so looking at kind of like i'm just looking at some of the cards with the mechanics is this a fairly kind of medium to almost kind of you know light heavy type game with the amount that's kind of going on i would say i would say it's um you know medium maybe a little bit light heavy for some folks um type of game because it's really simple mechanics you're going to be choose utilizing your action tokens yeah. each turn to move your character around the board but that action token will also trigger one of the three different uh sections of your player board that will allow you to either forage mm-hmm. cook serve um or reserve um or study which lets you all of those abilities become more powerful <laughs> um, so you can actually go to the library and gain additional skills yeah um well so uh it's a really cool way of kind of like easing people into the gameplay so it's like you're going to do something pretty simple just go ahead and do this one thing and you're going to be able to build upon that after each turn over and over again yeah i mean i don't mean to go back to your previous work but (laughs) i mean something like ashes was it was yes it was a game it's like yes you play a card or you get a conjuration or you take an action but it was like it was just like the simple case of you can do this type of action or you can do this kind of action and then the whole different kind of permutations across the kind of the different characters and no two characters were like exactly the same that's why it remains one of my kind of favorite games ever and i'm kind of getting this i've said it all it is it's like i've literally write about it Oh, I'll sh- okay, look, I'm going to show you something, right? Tabletop Gaming Magazine, which is going to be coming out very, very soon, okay? I do, and I'm self-plugging it, right? And I'm just going to put the light on, and I'm just going to show you, right, that I write, write an article, article about online rule books, and I directly reference Ashes Reborn, and if you look in the centre of the article, I don't know if you can see that. Do you see that? Amazing. Do you see that? I love it. <laughs> There's a big picture of Ashes Reborn right in the middle of the article because I directly reference it. So I'm a big fan. Well, you've proven it. Now you've proven just, that it's you what, know what I mean. <laughs> Fanboy. You know, it's like I'd be asking for selfies. But anyway, um, so yeah, so this kind of thing, I. I'm kind of looking at this and going, yeah, there's going to be some crunch in here and there's going to be just enough crunch to keep people interested. And also... Yeah, for me, um, with my designs, I really really enjoy that level of simplicity, like getting people into the gameplay and understanding the game as quickly as possible and really letting the theme marry um, that uh, gameplay as well so Mm. people have a clear understanding of how that all works together. Um, but also then layering in some very interesting decisions along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I want players to feel like they have a lot of different avenues to explore um, and that they can go ahead and try some different strategies in order to try to gain victory, um, which I really enjoy. And like with these last two games with Keystone and now with Wild Gardens, mm. I've also been really enjoying the ways to kind of structure solo play and having solo play not be too much of a deviation away from the standard game play yeah. but having it be an opportunity for you to start telling a story uh to the players and having them connect a little bit more um with the characters in the world that you've created uh in these games as well now um one of the things with keystone is it worked pretty well a, a kind of a two-player so is have you got like have you kind of like when you've been designing and looking at it have you thought of kind of like an optimum kind of player player count that you've been designing around or um have you just kind of like well it's going to play pretty well regardless if it's just two people sitting down or kind of like if you get like four or five i like to stick 
I like to stick, especially in recent days um, with my design. I like to stick between one and four players. I think it's a good hmm. it's a good indicator of mo- what what's going to be available for most groups, and it also usually stays within the range of being able to be enjoyable at either player count. Yeah. Like obviously, there's some uh, specifications and changes that need to be uh, made when you're doing solo play, hmm. but between two to four players, um, if most games can handle that kind of level. My only exception, I would say, would be like in my history of what I've designed in the past is obviously Ashes. I think it's optimal at two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even though it can play up to four, optimal at two. Um, and uh, with uh, Forgotten Waters, we went all the way up to seven players with that. And I think like it definitely has some really interesting dynamics when you get up to that level of group because there's so many different things that can happen yeah. and crop uh across um opportunities tell stories uh with the players at the table so i think that's a really cool way of doing that too but with wild gardens in specific i don't think you're gonna have too much of a difference as far as like the level of enjoyment that you're gonna have Mm. between two to four players i think they all of them play within a good amount of time you're gonna get just as much crunchiness um and there's not too many different ways in which players are interacting or over interacting with each other. Um, It really has a nice little balance of that. Mostly you can skip uh, players. You'll be able to move a little bit further. The more players that you have, because you skip over different pathways. Okay. um, With players. Okay. Um, But in one player also, then you get an entire story aspect. So there's an entire different experience there. Um, So uh, I think, I think it does a really good job being able to balance that. I wouldn't want to necessarily take it any more. Yeah. Than that, I think Wild Guardians could probably handle a fifth player. Yeah. Um, but anything further would be a little bit much. And uh, uh, yeah, I think that that's uh, that's where it, where it belongs. One to four. So in in terms of like the sync the the solo mode, and again, I keep mm-hmm. going back to Keystone, but it's the it's the Keystone of my entire argument. Did uh, <laughs> But the difference. Because I've 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 always prepared a rant for a solo mode. Because sometimes our solo modes are just like score some more points, go against yourself on you go, son. Keystone, right? <laughs> you had little books and stories, and it was almost like mm-hmm. it was kind of like it was like a, it was almost like a narration of the kind of the this um this person kind of gaining experience in this kind of natural world. And for a solo mode, I'm usually expect, there's two things I usually expect in a solo mode. One of them is, and I've already said is, you know, get 60 points and be the top person, get 50 points and be the not toast. So top person, get 30 points. Hey, try again. Or you get like a David Turtsy kind of jam, which is, David Turtsy's rule book for solo play is usually about three and a half times the size of the rule book for the single player. He knows I've said this, by the way. He's not going to take this. He's not going to take this. He will take this the wrong way. But I haven't seen him for a long time, so I can probably get a good run on him if I saw him first. But with Keystone, it was this, and I'd advise people to have a look if you can, just to, you know, just to to see the kind of how the solo how the solo mode worked. And I take it he's taking kind of pages out of that book when it comes to Wild Gardens then. Are you doing the same thing? It sounds like you are with the story and the progression of the actual character. Yeah, I think um, what's really cool is that like in Wild Gardens is kind of a marriage between what I've learned with the Crossroads style system of games Mm -hmm. and with what we did with Keystone. Yeah, Um, it's a way to it's a way to like, yes, you're going to be in a similar way of Keystone. You're going to be going for different milestones and goals that you're trying to complete. Yeah. But at the same time, you're also navigating through the story. Mm. And what's really cool is in this system, since all the characters have their own entries and all different directions that you can go in, you'll be going ahead and interacting with one character. That character might open up the opportunity for you to interact with one or two other characters, and their stories might branch into other characters' stories yeah. as well. So unlike with Keystone, that was a very structured, you know, one page, yeah. like this is the story that you're into, now play the game. Yeah. Um, in this one, you're going to be interrupted by different story beats while you're playing the game and trying to make sure that you get through all those story beats um before the end of the game as well um that sounds i mean it sounds like there's an awful lot of content here but you're only i mean it's on it's on back kit just now and it's like a 50 dollar 
kind of entry fee. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, honestly a really good deal. <laughs> that is a ridiculous. <laughs> um, the MSRP is actually going to be $70. Yeah. So um, that's why, like, for our backers, for the people that are supporting us early, uh, this is definitely the time to get the game because you're going to get the most bells and whistles yeah. for your buck. Um, and uh, yeah, later on, it's going to be more expensive, unfortunately. Uh, there's a lot of different content in this game. Um, there's 48 different unique guests. There's 48 different unique recipes, mm. uh, 12 different location cards. Uh, the location cards and all of the recipes are double-sided. Yeah. So they all have they all have uh, different art pieces in the back as well yeah. um, and different interactions in which they, they utilize. They change up the game in really interesting ways. Yeah. Um, and then all of the guests have these like really expansive uh, story points in which you'll get to learn more about who they are and what they do and how they exist in the world of wild gardens so are you looking at coming from plaid hat obviously that they, they were kind of very much into kind of like the on online retail side of things afterwards i mean you could buy kind of pretty much most if not all of their catalog um whenever they were releasing product with the likes of say wild gardens and also keystone is that going to be part of the kind of the the rose gauntlet plan that you know you're just not come to, come and get it a crowdfunding or miss it forever are you, are you is the aim to kind of have kind of well, additional of course, printings um, and stuff like that as time goes on the 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 ideal for any company is to have your product available to everyone all the time yeah. always whenever they want it yeah <laughs> but that's not the reality of what can what can take place sometimes yeah. the more support that we get on the backer kit will allow us as a company to print additional products that then can be on the market and sold through distribution yeah. and also sold through our personal website. The less the less that we get on backer kit, the more conservative we have to be in production and yeah. production's its own long process that can take anywhere between 6 months to 9 months to get, you know, from the be- them receiving the files to us receiving it on our shores. Yeah. So we'll only have so much product that we'll be able to print after the campaign, depending on how many orders we get on backer kit, yeah. how many distributors want to carry the product, how much retailers want to carry the product. Um, and then we'll go ahead and see how the market treats the game. Like, does it sell out immediately? Do we Are we able to make enough funds to go ahead and go right back to production? Or are we going to have to wait and take it slow? Um, so that's just kind of reality of being in business and being in business in the tabletop industry yeah. and seeing whether or not your game is something that's going to live long term or did it just survive one print run? Is that all is it's going to do or is it going to be something that people are going to be clamoring for for a long time? Yeah. I've had some games in my past that have only gone through one print run and are still selling out of that single print run. I've had some games in my past that sold out of their print run before it even arrived <laughs> think, here yeah. and uh, have continuously been in print uh, ever since. So it just depends on the product. And hopefully Wild Gardens is one that will stay in print for a very long time. I think it's a very special game and I believe it will hit that milestone, but we'll see. And I mean, at the moment it is smashing the kind of the current milestone because you're wanting it was like it's doing, forty thousand dollars and you're like two two and a half times that so yeah. i mean that must you must be like that must be kind of that must make you smile at least yes we're very excited about this and we're very excited to also keep like with with keystone being our first product to be beating our, our first product so quickly mm. Um, so that's, that's amazing. And, you know, it allows us to do a lot more things. It keeps opening doors. Mm. It lets us also fulfill on those promises of all those games that we announced when we first started up. Yeah. And it's just like, yes, now we can move on to the next step and start really giving all of this investment and love and attention to this product mm. because this product is doing well. Brilliant. So as long as we're able to continue building on that, Lindsay and I can continue growing the company. We can add other team members. Yeah. We can continue uh, printing the, uh, the copies of the game. And we can continue building this community support that's going to allow us to keep living and uh, enjoying our lives and being able to uh, uh, make these amazing games and create all these products that we have sitting in our heads and want to put on paper. <laughs> <laughs> and so if people have listened along and they are, I mean, itching to find out more and to also to keep up with you guys in the future, um, where can we find you on the internet webs? Where do you exist? 
Yeah, so if you're interested in Wild Gardens, definitely go to Backer Kit. You'll find it under Wild Gardens. It's one of the first things on their mm -hmm. uh, creator page. Uh, if you're interested in finding out more about us, where you can go to our website, www.rosegauntlet.com, yes. or you can follow us on all our social media platforms. Pretty much every social media platform, we are at Rose Gauntlet. So uh, go ahead and find there. That was another great reason for the name that we chose. It wasn't taken by anybody else. That's, <laughs> so that is, I mean, that helped a lot with everything else that was going you're on. You're preaching to the choir here because that's the only reason we are what we're called. You know, <laughs> with this, you know, apart from the obvious mistake of not being able to put an apostrophe in every single bit of uh, social media, but you know, maybe it is the fact that we were not wizards, but maybe we are now. But there you go. Um, what we'll do is I will make sure that we put all of the links. Um, in the show notes so that we've got notes to show oh, um if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to then there's a couple of places you can find us if you get the next issue or the issue coming out of tabletop gaming magazine um i'm in there i've written a couple of pieces i'm very very i'm, I'm crowing like a rooster uh, one of them is uh, me I'm not going to tell you what it's about. One's an opinion piece of me sh being a grumpy old man shouting at a cloud. And the other one is an <laughs> interview with um, a Mr. Jamie Stegmeyer uh, about his latest game kind of expeditions coming out later this year. But you can also follow us on all the normal social media if you go to search for We Are Not Wizards and you'll find us in all those magical places where all the wizards hang out at the Dumbledore Arms um, etc etc I'm just embracing it now I might as well um, if you like what you've listened to tonight there's a couple of things you can do tell other people that we exist you know if someday if you um, um, if you know that somebody's a fan of Isaac's work and everybody is then invite them get them to have a listen um, if you yourself are a creator designer somebody involved in the board game space and you are interested in podcasting i have podcasted with lots of different people some people who have never podcasted before some people who have podcasted every night of their lives then feel free to drop me a message and we can arrange to get you on if you also if you like what you've listened to tonight please consider going to your podcast catcher of choice and give us a rating or a review and as we say it's been <laughs> it's been seven years you know i've been doing this for seven years People say if I'd done shoplifting, I would have been out in five. Um, but if you are going to be giving us a rating or review, don't give us 10 stars because it makes us big head. But at the same time, don't give us one star because it makes us cry. Give us something in the middle, like a five, because it's average. <laughs> and we're just a little bit average. But the person who's not being average is the rather wonderful, the rather fantastic, is going to be gushing like an absolute stupid, giddy little fanboy. <laughs> it is. I've literally got a box full of ashes right at my feet just now. <laughs> it's the wonderful, fantastic Isaac Vega. Thank you very, very much for coming on again. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Oh, it's just so good. Um, there's only two more things to do. The first is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Isaac? You are not wizards. There we go. <laughs> it's like a cat. I don't care. If he said yes, if he said yes, it'd be fine. You know, if they said, yeah, yeah, I'm a wizard, I'd be like, yeah, cool. <laughs> Show me your hat. Uh, and the next thing is to say, is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from Isaac. Say goodbye, Isaac. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> and it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Make something awful. And <laughs> look, it's getting, to, it's March. It's almost April. It's getting warm outside. Take your jacket off, take your hat off, step out into those wild gardens and have yourself a fun time. But until the next time, goodbye. Bye. <laughs>